What's the first writing exercise you give to your students? They read the first three chapters of the method writing book, and they have to write a journal entry in which they write like they talk. How long is the journal entry? Uh, it could be 500 pages, but for the sake of the class, they can only read two pages. Because otherwise, they could be reading 100 pages and would be there all night. But I don't say you, you can't, you know, I'm saying write as much as you want in your journal for that day or that week, but for the class, limit it to about 500 words, which is about two pages, so that we can respond to it, which is 500 is a pretty good normal chunk. But just a journal entry, just write like you talk. I, I, I want to hear your voice. If you're not writing like you talk, we will point out those sentences where you had, uh, he skillfully said, you know, adverbs, adjectives, all that writerly stuff. We'll point it out and we'll, we'll try to get you not to do that. And then in anticipation of the next chapter, we start identifying transformation lines. And then the following week, they have to write a journal entry, writing like you talk, but massaging a transformation line. And sorry, the transformation line again is? I was hiding the birthday cake. Get rid of the birthday cake. What's the story of your life and the truth of who you are? I was hiding. I didn't want people to see me. I was afraid they wouldn't like me. If they saw who I was, they would hate me. I'm not a good person. I'm a bad boy. Well, I was hiding, ends up, I'm a bad boy. Because I remembered being locked in the closet and I'm a bad boy. That's, just, that's the bottom story of my life. I'm hiding because I don't want people to see me. I don't want people to see me because they'll know who I am. If they see who I am inside, they know I'm a bad person. And then suddenly it came to me, I'm a bad boy. Well, that's a long way from I was hiding. I'm a bad boy. And then from I'm a bad boy, I'm stuck, which is where you ended up. Right. So that's, I'm teaching them how to massage a transformation line. Then we, do, uh, then we do the image moment for two weeks because it's hard. And then we do a, something called dreaded association, which is another two weeks. Again, too complicated to go into now, but it was originally called the association exercise. And when I would assign it to people and they would read it, um, they would get notes from their mother as to why they were sick and couldn't come to class. Because <laughs> <laughs> they would dread it so. So then, I, as a joke, I called it the dreaded association exercise. And that's what we call it. And then, of course, they do it, and they bring it to class, and they're, they're just shocked as hell how good it works and what they can do with it and how it can be a very creative thing. And those are the four concepts in the first level. Right like you talk, massage transformation line, image moment, and the dreaded association exercise. How many of your students are actually able to write in a journal and not censor themselves, not try to be too writerly? Eventually, all of them. But in the beginning, is that something that a lot of them struggle with? Many of them don't have a problem with it. They, they, they haven't had enough experience writing that uh, they know how to be writers. The ones that have been writing a lot and who think of themselves as writers or I'm an actor, you know, they might have a little difficulty uh, or it might just be a sentence or two here and there. And so we pointed out, I talk about the structure of the sentence and why that's written and not spoken. That if you were talking, you would have said it this way or it would go this way or that word would be there. So we get into the structure of the sentence and the difference between speech and how we write. For instance, um, here's a sentence that is absolutely fine, you'll see it in, in books all the time. Uh, it begins with a participle phrase. Standing by the window, I could see it was going to rain. Nothing wrong with that sentence. Great sentence. But we don't talk that way. We don't begin sentences with participle phrases. We don't say, 
Uh, yeah, I came home and standing by the window, I could see it was going to rain. That's not how we structure a sentence when we talk. What we say is, I was standing by the window and I could see it was going to rain. Or when I stood by the window, I could see it was going to rain. But never standing by the window, comma, I could see it was going to rain. That's not how we talk. So we get into the structure of sentences, how it's not always a word, you know, because everybody has different vocabularies. So it's not about that. It's about the structure of the sentence, how a sentence is structured. And once you start to hear the, the deep structure of speech as opposed to the deep structure of a literary construct, it doesn't mean it's bad writing. It just means you have to know the difference. Then if you know the difference, you can choose when to do one and when to the other. So maybe at the worst, uh, a few people will have one or two of those sentences somewhere in what they write, and we deconstruct it and we talk about it. So basically, I'm getting them to be aware of, of their writing that is speech-based. Now, it's not always going to be that. Level two goes into those four tones that are not like you talk. So we're writers, and we can do that too. But first, we want to, like acting, we want to have a good foundation so where you write like you talk. Once in a while, I'll get someone who's been writing a long time, and they're really locked into their style, and it's hard for them to shift out of it. To Because they think, they just think it's natural to throw in those adverbs and adjectives and so forth. But when you, there's not, it's not good writing sometimes. So sometimes even their writing writing is not good writing. But most people take to it pretty well. Why is it not good writing? When, when someone's writing too writerly, too, too using different terms that we wouldn't use in normal conversation. Uh, if you've got a laptop around, Google Stephen King adverbs. He's got an essay on it. Adverbs. It's what amateurs do. It's bad writing. So don't take my word for it. Stephen King, who's a good writer, by the way. Excessive use of adverbs is the mark of an amateur. Um, uh, Elmore Leonard. He had an article in the New York Times Review of Books, um, which was all about the 10 things that bad writers do. The first one was excessive use of adverbs and often adjectives. I mean, you have to have adjectives sometime, but you got to be careful. Um, it was so well received that his publisher made it a book. Now, how do you make a book out of one page article in the New York Times Review of book, Books, I'll tell you. You have illustrations on every page, you have type that's very big, and the paper is about as thick as a two by four. And then you get a book, and it's sold really well. And number one is excessive use of adverbs and adjectives. So, you know, this is not something that I made up while I was living in a cave. Every, every professional writer will tell you that you can, you can spot an amateur when they overuse ad, adverbs and often uh, even the adjectives. So who am I to argue with Stephen King and Elmore Leonard? It's bad writing. Now, there's other things that may not be bad writing, but it's not how you talk. So that's a different thing. I want people to know the difference so that they can control when they're writing, what effect they're going to create. He mumbled, he uh, averred, uh, he implied, he, he shrugged. You know, uh, I don't care if you live or die, he shrugged. So instead of saying a word that has to do with uttering, it's, it's a physical action. I mean, writers do that, bad writers do that all the time. And, you know, I feel like sometimes I, I got to go, Quit it. Quit it. So keep it simple. Well, that's a different issue. Oh, okay. You can say complicated things, but you say it like you talk. I'm not saying you can't write complicated sentences. Okay. Okay.
It's just a question of, is that speech or is that a literary construct that came when people started to write? The difference. One of the problems a lot of people have with Marcel Proust is his fancy language. If you read him fast, you realize he's writing like he talks. There's a great deal of eloquence in there, but if you read it fast, you realize, oh, he's talking. And the elegance that you think you're seeing is often just long sentences. Some sentences are half a page, but he's talking. You had asked me about another book, uh, books I've read. So another one that I read during the pandemic, or it was on the uh, Libby app for the library, was uh, My Salinger Year. So it was about a woman who worked at a, a publisher in, I think, the 90s. And her job was to respond to J.D. Salinger fans. And it's so great. And they made a film and it has... Um, uh, Margaret Qualley in it, and uh, right. Sounds want good. to see it. Yeah, but but she wanted to take care in responding to these fans because they were so emotional and they were so invested right. in holding Caulfield. And she found that a lot of them didn't want to hear what she had to say. They wanted to just have this image of what that character was and what the book meant. Right. And she character, wanted to help them. Yeah. Character <laughs> creates plot, and voice creates character. Salinger never wrote another book in that voice. If you read Franny and Zoe and Raise High the Roof Beams Carpenters, it's a completely different style and voice. If you read some of his short stories, like Uncle Wiggly in Connecticut or The Laughing Man, it's not Holden Caulfield at all. It's not that style. That, that was Holden's voice. It's unique, and it's what makes his character so unique, the voice. You get the voice, you get the character. You get the character, the plot will take care of itself. Yeah. In fact, they became very angry. She was trying to help them, yeah. and they didn't want help. That's they wanted right. to be angry, and they wanted to be with Holden. They wanted to be yeah. with Holden. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it was a really fascinating book. Yeah. I'm looking forward to seeing the film. So. Yeah. Uh, wait, the Salinger years. Yeah. Uh, Not my, Catcher my, in the Rye. No, my Salinger no. year, and it's based yeah. on this woman in New York City in the 90s, yeah. and it's really No, I don't it. think they're ever going to make a movie of Catcher in the Rye, until when his book goes in the public domain or something, because he won't allow that. He's dead now, but uh, I think he has explicit instructions. It's not to be sold to the movies. Yeah, he had very rigid rules. I believe it sounds like he was a nice man. The way she described him in the book, I don't know. Yeah. his urban legend might have been different, but yeah. he 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 treated her well, and so she just had very little interaction at the publishing house. Right, but it was fascinating and. Just, yeah. you know, those anyway. things are kind of really not important, whether the writer is a nice man or not. You know? <laughs> Writers can be son of a bitches, you know, we may not realize it, but it really doesn't matter. What matters is the world they create. I don't care what Salinger was like. I love Holden. I love Holden. Interesting. And, and so he created something that was real for right. me. And that's that's all you can ask an author to do. A writer should reach the reader. It's not just about making themselves feel good or looking good to their peers. It's about reaching the reader. It's all of that. I mean, you do want to impress your peers. I mean, we're human. Well, we want other writers, you know, our, our peers to appreciate what we've done. Uh, obviously, I want people to like my poetry, but it means a lot to me if another poet who I admire really thinks my poetry is good. Okay. Um, and I do want to reach my readers, but at the same time, I want to satisfy myself. If, 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 if what I did, uh, a writer, sculptor, painter, makes me happy and I met the challenge, then I'll move on. At some point, you can't really go by what people think of your work. You, you have to do it because it's your calling. It's what you have to do. But who wouldn't want someone to like their work? But is there a certain point where an author, an artist, becomes so controversial that it stops being about their work, and now it's just the legend of the artist, the mystique around them, the reputation, whether it's true or not? Okay, and if that's true, what, what are we going to do about that? And that's what I'm asking, yeah. What, what should, should someone do if their, their work is transcended to that point? 
What's, look, the, everything is going to happen under the sun. Uh, you know, there's not. I mean, I, I I can't pontificate and say, well, it should be this way or it should be that way or it shouldn't be this way. It shouldn't be that way. You know, it's going to happen, and sometimes it's out of the writer's control. Things happen that they didn't expect or they didn't want, and sometimes they want that. They they act a certain way and. There becomes a legend about how they are, and they cultivate that legend. Uh, you know, I mean, writers are people, and you know, people are crazy. Not every crazy person writes a novel, but some of us do. <laughs> it doesn't make us sane just because we can write a novel.